everyone, my name is Christina. Thanks for joining us online here at the church at Rancho Bernardo. Today we're going to worship together, we're going to read the scriptures together with one of our teaching pastors, and we're going to hear more about how our church is being a good neighbor in our community. We may be in San Diego, but if we're not in your neighborhood, we still have resources for you to check out. Make sure you subscribe to Garden Music on YouTube and our daily devotional podcast. Well, let's go to church together.
Welcome back. Thanks again for joining us online. Make sure you follow us on social media and hit that subscribe button on YouTube so you can keep up to date with everything going on here at the church. We believe there's no better way to start your morning off than in God's presence. We also know how easy it is for life to get in the way. That's why we created the Daily Devotional Podcast. Each day we release a short episode to lead you in your time with the Lord. Text Daily Devotional to 97000 to get started. Did you know that you can worship throughout the week with our band, Garden Music? You can find them on social media, YouTube, and your favorite streaming channels. Their new album, For the City, is out now. It's a result of 10 leaders from seven churches that came together with one heart for our city. Give it a listen today. Well, if you're in our neighborhood, we want to invite you to in-person events like our men's and women's ministries, boardroom and greenhouse, and of course, our weekly youth night. If you'd like to serve in our community, Good Neighbor Day is coming up on February 26th. We'll have a bunch of awesome projects that you can participate in to help spread the love of Jesus in our neighborhood. Registration is open now, so head over to our website to sign up for a project. Lastly, here at the church, we want to thank you for your financial generosity. When you give to the ministry of the church at RB, you're giving to God's kingdom work and helping bring a little up there, down here. Giving creates space for God to do something new in your heart. So if you're ready to take that next step in your generosity, visit us online at crb.gives. Let's continue to worship together and then we'll tune in live to the worship center for the message.
Good morning, everybody. So good to see you 10 o'clock, whether you are in person or online. We are thrilled that you are joining us for church today. And uh, I just want to say, hey, can we thank our, uh, our, our band? I just love these guys so much. And the way in which they lead us, it's, it's incredible. And I know them well enough to know it's not just their talent, it's their character that they lead with. And the way in which DJ pastors us week in and week out, man, he's just unbelievable. And uh, it's just an honor and a thrill. Uh, every week I come up here, I'm like, man, I hope I don't drop the ball because it's going so well in the room. And uh, it's just, it's awesome. And uh, hey, I want to come to the uh, conclusion today of a series that we began at the beginning of the year uh, called Something New Under the Sun. And the heart behind the series is that uh, in a culture where everything's shifting, where the snow globe of life has been turned upside down and shaken. And everybody's trying to figure out their stake in the ground, their place in life. What's the, the new thing? I think there's a lot of FOMO, fear of missing out, going on right now. If I don't do this, am I going to miss out for the next 20 years? And there's a lot of shifts and changes, not just uh, in culture, but at the beginning of a new year. As you look at who you want to be by the time 2023 rolls around relationally, financially, you start asking the big questions at the start of a year. And so this series has been uh, looking at that and saying, hey, maybe the new thing that God God wants to do is not out there. It's not a car. It's not a job. It's not a vacation. It's actually what God does. It's in here. The new thing God does is inside of you. Christ says about you, Paul says about you in the scriptures that in Christ you're a new creation. Uh, the old is gone. The new has come. That's what we announce together through song, through worship, through reading the scriptures, that that's what God does. And at the same time, we, we kind of hedge this against a verse in the Old Testament where a guy named Solomon, who uh, most scholars, historians would say is the wisest, richest person who ever lived. And he said, hey, there's, there's nothing new under the sun. So whatever it is you're cooking up, that new city, that new job, that new car, that vacation, that thing you can't wait to do, Solomon says, been there, done that, it's the end of the day, that sweet vacation to ski in the place you've never been, it's just a hill, it's just snow, it's just dirt, for crying out loud. Hey, oh, that's a wet blanket on all my big 2022 plans. But Solomon says, hey, there's nothing new out there for you. The new thing is actually in here. And what if instead of pursuing something grand out there and you said, hey, I, if I could just get there, if I could just get that job, if I could just do that, if I could just buy that, man, life would finally be set up the way it should be. The New Testament comes around and says, hey, God wants to do something unfamiliar right here in the middle of the familiar scenery of your life. You don't need a new house or a new spouse. You need a better relationship with the spouse that you have. You don't need new friends. Uh, I talk to people all the time. They're like, man, I, my friends are lame. I, I need new friends. Like, well, they picked you somewhere along the way. I don't know. Uh, you need a better connection and to apologize to the friends you have. You need God to do something in that familiar setting. And that's who God is. He does uh, new creation in the middle of the old one. And so we've just been looking at that week in and week out. And uh, today I, I want to look at this tension. I think all of us have it, whether you're a Christian or not, between that pursuit of the new thing in our culture where we're constantly conditioned to throw something away and go after the new thing. And that tension we have between embracing nostalgia and the old thing, there's that, that constant dynamic at play in our heart. We want the new thing, but we want the old thing. That's why Keanu Reeves this year re-entered the Matrix, a new Matrix movie, but it's really just, it's an old movie. Taylor Swift re-released her, she put out a new record, but did you listen to the new record? It's really just all the old songs. She just re-released the new, because we have this tension in us between the new and the old. And this passage of scripture we're going to look at today, Jesus puts his 
finger on that tension that we all feel. You feel it today. We all feel it. There's that part of you that, think about a love story. You love the news love story, the movies, the songs. They're all about the uh, effervescent puppy love. You know, they just met, you know, the sparkle. Uh, But there's also that part of you that loves the story about the couple that's been sitting on the front porch holding hands for, you know, 50 years. And there's that, that nostalgia. There's that, that, that vintage element to it. There's that constant game between the new and the old. You think about a car. There's part of you, man. I want the latest technology, the new car, the new thing, the most horsepower, zero to 60, the fastest. But there's also that part of you, man, the 1966, you know, whatever. Uh, Any car people here? Any car? Okay, a few of you. Yeah, this is North County. Your car, people. Uh, there's, that, there's that part of you. You love that part of it as well. And so Jesus is going to put his finger on that particular tension. And maybe for you, somewhere in life right now, you're trying to figure out, you know, is it a new job, a new city? Is it a new place? Do we do the new thing? Uh, or is it staying here in the familiar job with the people that I already have relational equity with and this place that I've already, you know, gained a reputation? Is it, do I want the new or do I want to embrace uh, the, the history of where I currently am? Or it could be in terms of a house. You're like, man, do I, do I want to test the market and, or, or, you know, move to a new place and get rid of this house where the memories are and you can still see the kid's height chart in the laundry room. What, what is it? Uh, we, we always have that, that dynamic at play in us. And Jesus puts his finger on that tension. If you have a Bible, you can turn with me to Matthew chapter 9. If you don't have a Bible, uh, you can follow along on the screens. That's a great place to follow along. Or if you have the, uh, the Church at RV app, uh, that's a great place to, uh, to follow along as well. How are we doing, 10? You doing good? <laughs> You look, you look fantastic. You're a sight for sore eyes. Just good to see you. Okay, Matthew chapter 9. This is uh, Jesus uh, talking to his disciples and uh, a crowd of people. And there's a couple of places in the scriptures where this passage is, but I like Matthew's version, so that's the one we're going to read today. Uh, Matthew chapter 9, verse 16. And he, uh, he mixes a couple metaphors. One's a sewing metaphor, and one is a winemaking metaphor. He says, No one sews a patch of unshrunk cloth on an old garment, uh, which I've actually done that, so I can't say no one, but it's, I'm not trying to contradict Jesus. This sermon's not off to a great start. Uh, but if you do, uh, I've experienced this, and you probably have too, the patch will pull away from the garment. Uh, that's what happens, Jesus says, making the tear worse. And then he says this, verse 17, uh, neither do people pour new wine into old wineskins. How many of you have heard this before? He's heard this first. Yes, do not pour new wine into an old wineskin. Some of you, this is the only passage of scripture you know. Uh, <laughs> the one about the wine. Like, I know Jesus made, made wine one time, and uh, you quote that verse to all your friends. And, uh, and then you know this one. You know two verses, and they both contain wine metaphors. If they, uh, if they do, Jesus says, the skins will burst, the wine will run out, and the wine skins will be ruined. He says, no, they pour new wine into new wineskins, and both are preserved. He says, do not pour uh, your, your, your new wine into an old wineskin. He says, no, pour new wine into new wineskins so that both the new wine and the wineskin can be preserved. Now, uh, you read that, and on the surface, it sounds like Jesus is making a statement against frugality. Uh, don't be so cheap and pour your, pour your new wine that you spent all this time making into an old wine skin. Now just go out, pony up the cash for the, for the new wine skin. You know, you want to preserve that stuff. Uh, you're going to ruin both if you don't. Uh, but actually, uh, there's a, like an ancient word play here going on. Any, any Wordle fans? Anybody here do Wordle? A uh, f- few Wordle, I-, I love people with too much time on their hands, man. Uh, anybody doing Wordle right now? Like he said, download the app, Wordle. Uh, if you don't know what Wordle is, I don't, I, we're not going to get into it. It's like, anyway, uh, there's an ancient word play that's going on here that Jesus is doing. Now in the English language, uh, when it comes to the word new, 
we have one word for the word new. It's, um, it's new. And you use that word to describe lots of things, even if they're not necessarily new. Uh, you would say about, uh, if you buy a used car, you would say, hey, uh, do you like my new car? And it's like a 2014, but you'd be like, it's, it's new to me. Uh, if you bought a, uh, if you moved into a new house or a new apartment, you would say, hey, uh, come over. We're going to, you know, have a party at my new, my new house, my new place. But it's like, well, it was built in 1976. It's not new, but it's, 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 we use that word over and over again. In the Greek language, the language that this comes to us in, uh, you actually, you have two words that you could use to describe something that's new. Uh, the first is the word neos. Neos. Uh, in fact, we're going to say that word on the count of three. Uh, one, two, three. Neos. neos. Well done. Neos. If I pulled into your driveway today in a 2022 Corvette, <laughs> uh, you may say about this particular car, uh, wow, uh, this, this is quite neos. Uh, it's, it's new, it's fresh, it has 14 miles on it. It's, it's uh, like it's, it's right out of the factory, just drove it off the lot. Uh, it's, it's neos, it's fresh. Uh, if I pulled into your driveway today in a 1957 Corvette Resto Mod, some of you just leaned in to the sermon. Uh, you, you wouldn't say this car is new. Uh, the word that would be used in the Greek would be the word kainos. Let me hear you say kainos on the... Not yet. <laughs> oh my goodness. All the patient people are online. Um, the, <laughs> the, uh, uh, on the count of three, kainos. One, two, three. Kainos. kainos. Kainos is how you would describe something. It's not new. Uh, in a way, it's, it's better than new. It's, uh, it's like this car, this 1957, it's, it's uh, every inch of it's been gone over and restored. It's a resto mod. It's vintage. It's not new, but it's, it's actually, well, this is, this is like better, better than new. It's, it's kainos. The reason I say that is because if you read this, this passage again, uh, Jesus is doing a bit of a wordplay here. And he says, no, they pour neos, so the fresh wine, into kainos wineskins, and both are preserved. Uh, he's, he's saying the, the kind of wineskin you need is not the brand new one. That one's actually going to be useless to you if you pour the new wine in it. The one you need is the one that's kainos. It's vintage. It's better than new. It's weathered some storms. It's been through some stuff. It's actually lived a little bit. Uh, that, that's actually the thing that, that you, you need to hold. It's, it's kainos. In the ancient world, you would not store wine in a wine barrel like we do in the 20, 21st century. You would store it in a wine skin. And the kind of wine skin you'd want to put your good expensive wine in would be the kind of wine or the kind of uh, wine skin that it was kainos. If you put the new wine into a, uh, a brand new wine skin that you just made, it was going to crack. The leather wasn't supple enough. It, it, would, uh, it would ruin both. You would go look for the, the worn in wine skin that had been outside of the tent. It had been rained on. It had endured a few, you know, harvests. It had been filled up and, you know, replenished a few times. If it had started to crack, you just rub some olive oil on it and it was it wasn't new but it was better than new and Jesus says that's the kind of wine skin that you need it's not it's not you know you didn't just buy it it's it's better than new it's worn in it has some age some wear some tear some scars some stories that's what you're looking for it's kainos I say that because I wonder how often in our life we bail on something the moment it's just starting to get interesting are you with me the moment something is moving out of the neos stage into the kino stage in our life, we're so conditioned to pursue the neos in a neos culture that we bail on the thing before it ever gets to kino status. Because we're so conditioned in our heart and our soul to pursue the, the new thing, the shiny thing. I don't want to miss out. I want the latest, the greatest. And, and we miss out. Jesus says, no, the, the thing that actually uh, you, you need that endures is, is the kainos thing. It's actually weathered some storms. It's actually been through some tough moments, some adversity. And it's, it's pliable It'll expand, it'll contrast, it's, it's, the, it's, it's better than new, it's kainos. 
how often do we bail on something when it's in the kainos state, it's headed towards the kainos state when it's actually going to become the most valuable to us. I wonder how often, maybe it's in terms of friendships. We're always looking for the neos friendship. The, I even was thinking the other day about uh, my, my son Hayden. He came home from school and he said, um, Dad, I, I, I made a, a new friend at school. And I was like, that's great. What's her name? And, or his name. And he, so he t- tells me the name. And I was like, well, that's great. I'm, and I, I said, um, well, you know, you know what they say. And I t- I, we went over the nursery rhyme. Remember the nursery rhyme? Make new friends. Keep the old. One is silver and the other is... Right, that's terrible advice. <laughs> I mean, think about what you're saying. That new friend that you made, well, that's gold. The one that you've had for like, you know, a couple years that's actually like played with you on the playground. That's silver place now, son. Uh, the, the, the idea, we're always looking for the new thing. Uh, go, after, go after the new. We're so conditioned for the new. Uh, maybe in your life, in terms of friendships, the moment the friendship gets hard, the moment the dinner party went awkward, the moment where somebody said something you didn't like and you bailed on it, and you, you was like, well, we just need some new friends. That was actually the moment that friendship was going to develop a, a kinos dimension to it where it had weathered, been through some scars, some apologies, uh, but we toss it before it ever gets there. Or maybe it's in terms of uh, a job where I get it, it's a gig economy. Maybe you do need a new job. Maybe you do need a a different city, a new landscape for your life. But we often go, well, if I could just get to that and we bail on the job where we have the equity, where we've built something relationally with the team because we're just looking for the new thing and the neos thing and we bail on the thing that actually has some weathering and some kinos dimension to it. Jesus says the, the thing that you need, it's actually... It's, it's not new. It's actually better than new because it's, it's pliable. It's weathered. It's, it's, it's lived through something. That's what you should pursue. Uh, and if we're honest, I mean, think about it. So often the things that we want in life that are new, they're really just some version of something that's old. Have you seen gene trends lately? <laughs> I know, I feel a hundred years old saying this, but have you like just, maybe you have a teenage son or daughter and you're like, what, like, what are you wearing? You're like, I threw those out in 1995 (laughs) and you're telling me like, we could have made a fortune on eBay, honey. Like what in the world? Uh, Because the the new thing is often just some version of the old thing because the world at its, at its depths, it craves kinos. It craves something that's, that's weathered, that's been through something. A couple of weeks ago, I took my, uh, my two oldest boys to uh, Scottsdale, uh, Arizona, for the Barrett-Jackson car show. Anyone ever been to the Barrett-Jackson car show? Uh, oh, my goodness. And it's American muscle car after American muscle car after American muscle car. And you can climb into some of these things. And uh, my boys, they, uh, they climbed into the new whatever hybrid thing with a 45-inch plasma TV. I don't know how anybody drives anywhere anymore. And they were like, man, this is incredible. And at one point, Dane, my oldest, he's 10. He, uh, he's like, Dad, you got to come see this. You got to come see this. And it's like football field after football field after football field of cars. And we go over and he shows me this car. He's like, dad, look at this. He goes, it's a 1977 Firebird that Burt Reynolds himself drove. <laughs> I was like, buddy, how do you even know who Burt Reynolds is? Like, how is that possible? And why did you run past 10 Corvettes that are brand new out of the factory to show me this? There's no technology in this car. It just has a big eagle on the front. And I don't know why you even know who Smokey and the Bandit is. I don't even know if you're allowed to watch. When did you watch that? Where was your mother? <laughs> it's like Burt Reynolds' dad. Burt. Can you believe it? Smokey. Can't believe it. And he understood at a... At a cellular level, this was not new. It was actually, it was better than new. I know I've used this before, but in terms of music, uh, my boys, they, you put on the latest, greatest, top 10 pop, I don't care who it is. My kids are like, turn the station. Why are we listening to this? We put it on the oldie station. Like put it on, I'm telling you the other day, run around Sue came on and my kids are like, woo, run around Sue. <laughs> I'm driving like, honey, how is this possible that my parents and my kids torture me with the same music? <laughs> 20 years apart from each other. How is it that my, when I was, you know, 
10. My parents were torturing me with Run Around Sue. And here I am in my 40s. And my kids are torturing me with the same music. It's because at a cellular level, they understand something's not new. It's actually, it's weather. It's kinos. It's, it's, it's better than new. It has a dimension to it that is not going to fade away. I wonder for how many of us in the room, if we get really honest, uh, maybe you're headed into your 50s or 60s and the whole world's changing and you feel it at at your bones. You know everything's changing, everything's new, and there's a part of you that's going, man, I think my best days are in my past. I don't think I have a whole lot to offer this industry anymore. I don't think I have a whole lot to offer this uh, relationship or whatever it is anymore. And you kind of sit at the table at the meeting and you're kind of hesitant to speak because the fresh ideas come from the new guy or the young uh, girl who's got all the, you know, she gets Bitcoin and you're like, I don't, bit who? I don't know. And, and you feel like, man, I think my best days are behind me. Is it possible your best days are in front of you because you're actually Kainos? And that moment where culture says, hey, it's time to go to Palm Springs and pick up shuffleboard, buddy. (laughs) It's actually the moment where you've weathered some storms, you've been through something, you're more pliable, you have more peace, more patience, more kindness, the things that the world actually craves at a deep level, and it's better than just the latest, greatest idea. You actually have more to offer now than ever before. Just rub some olive oil on it and get back in the game. Uh, There's actually, you have, when you open your mouth, it's not just expired milk coming out, it's fine wine because you've been through some stuff. You know what I'm talking about. You've lived. That's what the world, your best days are not behind you, they're actually, you're, you're kinos. You actually have something to offer now because of what you have been through in your past. Uh, the, the, the world craves the, the, the kinos. The world craves it at a deep at a deep level. Uh, Paul, I think, is hinting at this uh, in one of my favorite passages of Scripture. I love this, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 16, and he's talking about the life of Christ. When you have invited Spirit into you, when Spirit is forming you, when you're waking up in the morning and being shaped by Spirit in your life, he says something powerful has happened in Christ to you. And he says this, and I, I love the, the, the curves of the words that he uses here and the way he uses language is so brilliant. Uh, it's, it's almost like he had help. Uh, verse 16 of 2 Corinthians chapter 4, he says, therefore we do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away. That's not real encouraging, Paul. Uh, yet inwardly, he says we're being renewed day by day. If you're in Christ, He says, outwardly, uh, yeah, sunspots, uh, gravity's doing what it's doing. You got 15 creams on the nightstand trying to fix it, not working. You're like, man, what do we do? Uh, He says, outwardly, yeah, that's happening. He says, but inwardly, notice what he says. I love this. We're being renewed day by day. Spirit is in you, renewing you. So in the inside, it's like reverse engineering. You're like a little Benjamin Button in there. You are going backwards in time. And you're like a, like outside, it's like milk. There's an expiration date. Inside, like a fine wine, something's cultivating. It's getting better as time goes. Kainos is happening on the inside. And you've been pressing into Jesus, and Jesus has been pressing into you for all these years. And some love, and some joy, and some peace, and some patience is the wine that is being produced in you now. He says all, all that is taking some time, but it's, it's actually, you're getting better as the years goes on. Years go on. He says, for our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us. Uh, so the adversity you've endured, the pain you've endured, the struggles you've endured, uh, it, it, you, you, it's not neos, but it's, it's been doing the kainos work in you. He says all of that, there is an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. And then I love this. He, he switches lanes here and he says, so we fix our eyes not on what is seen, which you think about that sentence, it's so brilliant. Don't fix your eyes on what is seen. It's like, well, that's kind of how eyes work, Paul. But on what is unseen... Since what is seen, he says, is temporary, but what is unseen, and what's the word that he uses, is eternal. He says, that's what you're after. 
You don't want the Neos thing. You don't need the new whatever. The Like if we could just get that, we could just go there. If I could just experience the thing I've never experienced. He says, no, no, no. The thing you need is the, the eternal thing. He says on the outside, yeah, sunspots. On the outside, yeah, gravity. All that's happening. He says on the inside, there's this, this for, for the person who's in Christ, for the person who's been waking up and saying, spirit, lead me. Spirit, guide me. Be my, uh, my fortress in life, God. For the person who's been doing that through the storms of life and has experienced some weather some wear, some tear. There's a kainos dimension to your spirit now. And he says, I want you to, to lean into that. I want you to cultivate that. You go, well, how do I, how do, I do that? He says, well, uh, you got this thing going on on the outside, inside. You got the external, the internal. You've got the neos dimension to the external world. You got this kainos dimension to your spirit. He says, the way you cultivate that kainos in you is you train your eyes to see the unseen the kainos, the eternal, and you stop chasing all the neos temporary things of life, which is what we all want to obsess over, the neos. If I could just, I can't believe they made that. I got to get a, I can't believe now TVs are curved. I can't, this one's 15K. I got to, we we want the new whatever, whatever, got to get it. He says, don't fixate on the new thing. He says, that's all, it's like expired milk. You just keep drinking it. It is the, it's the kainos, eternal, unseen elements of life that actually develop, cultivate, give you some actual sustenance and meaning to who you are when you open your mouth and you walk in the room. You say, well, how, how does that work? Well, think about it. Even if you're not a Christian, I mean, you think of it this way. Uh, remember Christmas morning when you were a kid, you'd walk out, you were seven or 10 or however old, and you'd walk out and you'd see the tree. What did you want to see as a kid when you looked at the Christmas tree? You wanted, yeah, you wanted to see presents, but more specific, presents that had your name on it. <laughs> and you would count. And hell hath no fury like a little brother who has less presence than his older brother. I mean, you've seen that before. Uh, it's, it's loud. It's, it's not good. And, and it's because as a child, we want neos. We want the new. I, give me the shiny. Give me the thing I can see. Uh, somewhere along the way, uh, when you finally had enough ties or enough blazers or enough uh, rings or enough necklaces or whatever, uh, your son, your daughter, your husband, your wife, your girlfriend, your boy, friend, a family member said, hey, what do you want for Christmas this year? And you probably at some point in your life have said, don't give me another thing. Give me an experience. You've said that before? Some of you are like, no, I want the diamond thing, man. Thank you so much. Uh, Another tie is just fantastic with me. I don't want an experience with these people. What are you talking about? Uh, No, Uh, you said that. I remember the first time I said that. I felt like such an adult. I was like, wow, I've really grown up. Uh, Give me an experience. Why? Because at a fundamental level, you recognize the new thing you can buy. It's neos. It expires. You can get it out and look at it, but it it expires. Where that uh, that trip, that meal, that uh, maybe it was an only it was only an hour of you and your spouse together, but it was, it was like there was an eternal dimension to it. And it wasn't tactile, but it was better than real. It was, it, it had an eternal dimension vibe uh, to it. It wasn't, it wasn't uh, like, you couldn't put it out on the shelf, but it was, it was better than something that was, it was an experience that was better than real. It was better than something you could put your hands on. And Paul's essentially saying uh, the same is true. When you serve somebody, it maybe was only four hours, but there was an eternal dimension to that. When you cared about that neighbor for 20 minutes, there was an eternal dimension to those 20 minutes. He says, pursue the things that are eternal, not the things that are new. We're so conditioned to keep our head down. Just give me the new, give me the new, that we block out the things that actually give life meaning. He says, build your life, bank your life on the unseen, the eternal. That's what develops the kainos dimension mentioned to you. C.S. Lewis, one of my favorite authors, uh, he said it this way, and I love this quote. He says, everything that is not eternal is eternally out of date. Everything in life that you've been given this gracious gift by God called life, and we try to fill it up with all this expired milk, 
if I could just get that, if I could just get that. He's like, no, the whole time I was trying to give you fine wine. I was trying to give you something that was eternal, but you were so fixated on all this stuff that was eternally out of date. Bank your life. Pursue that which is eternal. And you go, if you boil that down, what does that mean? It means for you, for me, whether you're a Christ follower, whether you're not, the thing you need in life is not a new thing. The thing you need in life is an eternal thing. Something that does not fade away, something that does not expire, the thing that could never be taken away. Uh, Build your life on the eternal thing, not the new thing. As you think through who you're going to be in the next five years, ten years, uh, is it eternal? Am I building and cultivating kind of eternal dimensions to my life? You say, well, how does that work? Well, Paul has devoted a lot of the New Testament to explaining that which is eternal, to shifting our eyes towards that which is eternal, shifting our eyes away from the temporary neos dimensions of life. He says it this way in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, and this is a famous passage of scripture. I love this. He says this in verse 12 of 1 Corinthians 13. He says, for now we see only a reflection as in a mirror. He says, but the day will come, and he's talking about when you're face to face with Christ. He says, you uh, will see face to face. He says, now I know in part, then I shall know fully he says there's going to be a moment in eternity where you get it, where you're going to look at your life and be like, oh man, I just, I was chugging expired milk left and right. He says, but there's going to be a moment you're going to see it and you're going to be fully known by God. And he says in verse 13, and now these three remain. What remains in eternity? He says, here's what remains. Faith, let's just read these together. Faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. You trying to make a big decision in life right now? You're trying to navigate, what do I do? Where do we move? How does this work out? What's the plan? Paul says, let me give you a filter and a lens through which you should make all of your decisions. Does it increase faith? Does it increase hope? Does it increase love? That's your filter. That's your lens. Because that is eternal. And anything else that causes you to make decisions or pursue something, it's eternally out of date. Roseanne and I, last night, we were sitting at the kitchen table having a uh, finance conversation and looking at financial goals and we're trying to make, you know, money decisions and we're, we're sitting there talking to each other. It's like, well, what do we do here? What do you do here? Where do you hedge? How do you... At the end of it, it's just like, let's make eternal decisions with our finances. Let's make eternal decisions as we think about the next couple of years with the kids. Let's think about eternal decisions. What increases faith? What increases hope? What increases love? When you think about friendships, when you think about vacations, when you think about things you want to do, things, places you want to go, who you want to be, when you think about health, when you know, make eternal decisions. Does it increase faith? Does it increase hope? Does it increase love. Those are eternal. Those you can bank your life on. Everything else is eternally out of date and it will expire. Allow that to be the bit in your mouth, the carrot in front of you that you chase. Everything else expires. What kind of church do you want to be? A kainos church. What kind of Christ follower do you want to be? A kainos Christ follower. Everything expires, but Christ, you're doing the work in me. Spirit of God in me. I am being renewed day by day, and eternity has taken root in my blood and in my bones. Let's pray together this morning. God, we thank you, Spirit of God. Big decisions way. Big choices in relationships and finances and jobs and health. And we're often looking at a myriad of options, not quite sure which way to turn. God, would we choose whatever increases faith, whatever increases hope, whatever increases love. God, the things that we've bailed on in the last couple of years because it got hard, there was adversity. Would we lean back into, because there's actually a beautiful story of Kainos waiting to be written, a friendship that could be like a fine wine instead of expired milk. A relationship with a son or daughter that has weathered storms is the story we want to tell. Not the one that has sidestepped all adversity. Would you give us kindness relationships with our brothers and sisters? Would you give us kindness relationships with one another? Would we be the hands and the feet of Jesus to the city, doing the eternal work of God for one another and loving each other, loving our city, increasing faith, increasing hope, increasing love? God, would we not chase the eternally out of date? Would we chase the eternal as the sons and the daughters of God. Do that work in us. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray and all of God's children said, amen. Grace and peace.
Hey friend, thanks for coming to church with us today. We want you to know that we're here for you. If you want to connect with a pastor or counselor, please call the church the number below. And don't forget to engage with our daily devotionals and worship throughout the week with Garden Music, wherever you like to stream your music. We'll see you next time.